Um, I am delighted to uh, launch Grand Rounds today, November the 9th, um, and delighted to welcome Dr. Uguchi um, Uhoa Bunwa, who's a professor of medicine here at Emory in the Division of General Medicine and Geriatrics. She's the chief of the geriatric service line at Grady Memorial Hospital. There, she is also the medical director of the acute care for the elderly service and the medical director for the Grady Geriatrics Outpatient Clinic. She has led care process changes that have transformed the healthcare system, leading to its designation as an age-friendly health system and a niche hospital with implementation of age-friendly best practices in the emergency department, as well as outpatient departments during hospitalization and in transitions across care settings. And we're um, gonna get to hear about that today. She's also led curricular design for medical students, residents, fellows, and hospital staff, including nursery, pharm nursing, pharmacy, social work, rehabilitation services, all on the care of hospitalized older adults. And I can say that she is a popular teacher for the trainees that I have heard from. Her research has focused predominantly on health services utilization, care transitions, and health disparities among underserved populations. So Dr. Hoa Bunwa, I'm really excited to hear about the uh, process of transforming um, the healthcare system at Grady to be an age-friendly health system. And thank you so much for giving us this talk today. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to present today. Um, we have over the years um, been trying to improve the care of older adults at Grady. And so I've transitioned my role from the outpatient, mostly to the inpatient setting now, um, mostly acting as the director of the, the ACE unit from being the director of the, um, the geriatrics clinic. Um, I'm just gonna share a little bit about the journey that we've been on over the years to try to improve the care of older adults. As geriatricians, we see the burden of caring for older adults within healthcare systems. And so that's been our goal over the years to make sure that um, appropriate care is provided to older adults. So I have no conflict of interest. Um, some of the things I'm gonna be trying to do today um, it's really to describe the key components of age-friendly care, to describe some of the strategies that are needed to um, integrate age-friendly care into the standard care that's provided to hospitalized older adults, and then strategies to adapt the current age-friendly framework to address the needs of vulnerable older adults, such as we have at Grady Health System. Um, I'm, I'm going to share with you a couple of stories, a couple of patients that I cared for. Um, these stories are found to be very heart-wrenching and has actually changed my practice. And in addition to that, heightened a sense of urgency that I felt to um, build capacity amongst um, interdisciplinary teams, residents, medical students, but also change systems of care within the healthcare system to improve the care of older adults. Um, one of the patients that I cared for on the ACE unit, Mr. Brown, very functional prior to his being admitted to the hospital, 84 year old was driving up to when he came to Grady. He was actually admitted for COPD exacerbation. The first day I saw him, he seemed very well compensated cognitively. By the second day, as I was walking into the unit, uh, the occupational therapist called my attention to him saying that he had become very delirious. And so um, the medical team started him on Haldol and he was getting Haldol about two milligrams every four hours, PRN, that's the way it was ordered. Um, and so he got quite some Haldol and he developed acute dystonic reaction. And then we had to try to reverse that reaction with um, an anticholinergic medication. And so he became even more delirious. Subsequently, um, he declined significantly functionally and then the cognitive deficits that he had persisted for quite a while. He spent quite a long time at Grady and then he ended up being placed in a nursing home. One of the things that touched me most was the fact that this was someone who was very functional, who was living alone prior to his being hospitalized for something as technically simple as COPD exacerbation. And it wasn't as if he had any significant geriatric syndromes when he came into the hospital. Uh, the second patient that I had was Mr. Smith. 
um, who was admitted to the, to the trauma service, very functional 80 year old. He was admitted after a fall. He said he was actually cleaning his car when he fell. Um, again, his hospital course was complicated by delirium. And then which we thought was as a result of the medications that he was being given. Um, ultimately, he became unresponsive and then Code Blue was called and then he was transferred to the ICU, subsequently didn't do well, was transitioned to hospice and then he died. Again, one of the things that struck me again was a very functional 80 year old was functional enough to be cleaning his car, didn't seem to have any active geriatric syndromes prior to hospitalization and he fell came in, suffered from the adverse medication reactions and became very delirious. And, and that changed the whole trajectory and, and he died. So a number of these, these are like examples of a number of patients that I've cared for that have actually affected me and made me want to make sure that older adults are well cared for. And you know, as all of us know, older adults suffer from harm when they are within the healthcare system either during the transitions of care period or actually when they are in the hospital and suffer from multiple hazards. So over the years, um, geriatricians and, and non-geriatricians alike have tried to um, develop care processes for older adults, whether in the outpatient setting or whether in the inpatient setting or even to develop age-friendly communities to help care for older adults. So the World Health Organization actually develop the concept of an age-friendly city um, that's focused on transportation, housing, um, that's appropriate for older adults, um, also community support and health services, and other components just to make sure that older adults in the community are well cared for. Um, in Canada, they actually developed this in the early 2000s called the elder-friendly hospital model. And then besides that, they also have the senior-friendly hospital framework. Um, in which the concept was making sure that within a healthcare system, you had a physical design that was age friendly, but in addition to that, you had care systems and processes and policies and procedures that were also age friendly. Subsequently in, I think about 2017 or so, the IHI in partnership with John A. Hartford Foundation and the American Hospital Association and Catholic Health Association developed what's called the age-friendly health systems framework that's focused on four, um, four components essentially. What matters, trying to identify what the goals of the patient are, medications, making sure that medications are, are appropriate for older adults, um, mentation, making sure that mentation is addressed uh, when a patient is either in the hospital, in the emergency department, or even in the outpatient setting, and then also mobility. They felt that these were the four elements that would help improve outcomes um, of older adults. And this has become much more imperative, thinking about the numbers for older adults. So every, literally every month, up to 1 million people are turning 60. And then the population for the United States is expected to double over the next 30 years of those who are older than 65. So geriatric patients constitute 38% of hospital admissions and 49% of hospital days. And then uh, the rates of hospitalization are actually higher for patients who are over 85. And then bringing it home, Atlanta now is considered to be America's number one rapidly aging city. And so you're finding that the numbers are much higher in Atlanta. And so the goal for us, thinking about Grady, that's very well positioned to care for vulnerable older adults, is to think about how we can improve care for older adults. And that's been our question over the years, and that's what we've been trying to do and what I'm going to share with you. Essentially, what we did was to develop a framework on what to do both in the inpatient, um, outpatient, in the emergency room, and then how best to also make sure that our older adults are well plugged in in the community and have resources to help care for them. Um, and it's been a journey um, from 1997, we had just the um, senior services at Grady, Grady Gold, Geriatrics Outpatient Clinic and the Memory Clinic. And so over a period of, let's say about 12 years, not a whole lot was done much more besides the outpatient geriatric care. But as geriatricians, we felt that we needed to do much more at Grady. And so 
We try to engage the stakeholders. And one of the things we did was to try to build capacity um, with, you know, with the nurses. Um, and then also subsequently we launched the geriatrics inpatient care. And then we started some work in the emergency department also. And then a ma another major area of focus for us was also transitions of care. Um, so one of the major areas of focus for us was actually how to care for hospitalized older adults. We felt that we had done a good job in the outpatient setting um, of you know, trying to, to establish processes to make sure that our patients were seen uh, in the geriatrics clinic, but in addition to that also, to make sure that we have things like annual wellness visit that would help detect um, high risk factors in older adults who were seen in the primary care center. So our focus was now what to do to help improve the care of hospitalized older adults. And the hospital is a dangerous place for older adults. So an older adult can come in quite functional walking like the two patients I shared with you, but at the end of the day, they end up being um, very functionally um, dependent. So one out of every two older adults that coming to the hospital will suffer from one hazard of hospitalization or the other. Um, about 20% of older adults who are admitted to the hospital will suffer from delirium. And up to 67% of these patients would go unrecognized as having delirium, particularly those patients who present with hypoactive delirium. About 10% of older adults who are admitted to the hospital would suffer from adverse medication reactions, which are preventable in up to 50% of cases. And then a third of older adults who are admitted to, 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 admitted to the hospital would lose one ADL or the other. The significant thing about all these numbers are the association with mortality. So it's beyond the fact that Ms. Smith is, is delirious and she's agitated, but the fact that delirium is actually associated with mortality or the fact that uh, Ms. Smith came into the hospital able to walk, now she's not able to walk. But the numbers show that up to 11% of these patients who lose their ADLs are dead by three months, 17% are dead by six months. It, this was actually a multinational study that was done that showed this. So you have an older adult, sorry, you have an older adult who is functional, comes into the hospital um, with the hostile environment, the depersonalization, the bed rest, the dehydration and malnutrition, the cognitive dis dysfunction that happens and polypharmacy and so on, that older adult ends up being dysfunctional by the time they are leaving the hospital. Um, and then there are things that um, usual aging would do, right? You would have things like reduction in muscle strength. You expect that sensory impairment, reduction in bone density, the skin being more fragile. But when patients are put on bed rest, when they're in the hospital, multiple things go wrong. Older adult becomes deconditioned, could fall and fracture, could become delirious, could become more malnourished and dehydrated, yeah, so sometimes could, you have to could aspirate and so on. So multiple things go wrong with older adults when they're in the hospital. And so that's why the focus has been, what can we do to improve the care of older adults? How can we prevent some of these hazards from happening? So simple things, this seems very simple, right? This patient says, all I want for Christmas is to really have a good bowel movement. Very simple, but this simple things make a difference in the care of an older adult. An older adult not having a, a good bowel movement for a few days could contribute to delirium, could contribute to poor PO intake. And all these are independent risk factors for mortality. So one of the things that we did was to try to build um, services, physician-led services and, and nursing-led protocols. We felt that that would be a good way to try to um, create processes of care that would help improve the care of older adults. So some of the physician-led services were we launched the ACE unit, we also launched a geriatrics consult service, and then a co-management service with orthopedics and hospital medicine. Um, one of the major things that we did was also nursing. We felt that it was very critical that we build capacity amongst the nurses. We felt that even if we 
saw all the patients on the consult service and made recommendations to get the patients mobilized or to implement delirium protocols. If the nurses were not trained to implement those protocols, it, that it would be very ineffective. So that was the first step we took for us to become a niche hospital. And that involved building capacity, training nurses, training techs, um, and then training members of the interdisciplinary team Currently, we're at stage three in the levels of niche implementation, and we're heading towards a stage four right now with some of the things that we're doing. Um, the niche is essentially building capacity with these nurses, but also having geriatric resource nurses on the units. A geriatric resource nurse would act as a peer consultant for their colleagues. Uh, would also act as a clinician and educator and also a quality change agent. We also developed protocols, which was, um, these protocols were for the nurses for the various geriatric syndromes and uh, incorporated into EPIC. And, and this is an example of one of the niche delirium protocol that we have in EPIC for the nurses to use. And it outlines some of the protocols that it would implement if a patient presented with delirium. Um, we held several workshops, half day workshops, um, online training for the nurses with the niche modules and also the techs. We feel that the techs play a very critical role in the care of older adults by mobilizing them, by making sure that shades are up, lights are on, and various you know, components of delirium protocols, making sure that patients eat well. So we targeted both the nurses and the techs and then other members of the healthcare team in the training that we did. Um, so the next step that we took was actually for the physicians. We created an order set for the physicians. We felt that we wanted to make it very easy for them in caring for older adults. So all older adults admitted to the medicine service, 65 and older. Once the medicine teams are doing an admission, the ACE order set would kick in for those patients. And the ACE order set was you know, focused on a few things. Um, things like making sure that the mobility protocol was pre-checked and the clinician would essentially have to uncheck the patient being mobilized to indicate that the patient needed bed rest. Um, things like making sure that Foley's catheter was outlined as not indicated, um, non-pharmacologic measures for delirium, sleep protocol for patients, fall protocols, um, and then medications, we took out some of the high risk medicines that were in the order set for older, for younger adults and put safer medications for the older adults. We also address the pain medicines, you know, that, that are prescribed for older adults. Um, and then the next step we took was um, to, to launch the ACE tracker. So the ACE tracker is actually um, a list that, that has the patients, all older adults that are within the system, uh, we launched it for the ACE unit and a number of units where we had been doing the training sequentially. And what it does, it's to pick up on high risk factors in older adults. So able to pick up on whether a patient is on a beer's medicine, able to pick up on whether a patient is, has a bed rest order, um, able to, to um, all the screenings that are done for older adults, like the delirium screen, the cognitive screen, also populates this list. And at a glance, you can see what's going on with that older adults and you can essentially make changes. Um, it can, uh, we have it in two formats. We have it as part of the systems list, and then we also run it as a clarity report in EPIC. Uh, the good thing about the ACE tracker is you can, the resident, anyone can do it, can find out what high-risk medicines the patient is on by essentially highlighting the patient and typing it beers meds, and it would show you what high-risk medicines have been administered to the patient over 120 hours. So after we did that, because we felt that we needed essentially, you know, you would never have enough geriatricians within healthcare systems. So our focus was really to create systems of care that would be easy and that would enable other members of the healthcare team care for older adults well. Um, after we did that, we now launched the ACE unit at Grady. Um, initially, we started as a 10 bed unit. Now we have 30 beds. The primary teams are the academic medical teams. And uh, we, we act as a consultant on the unit, but proactively see all older, admit, um, older adults admitted to the unit. 
um, we have like a multidisciplinary team that cares for the patients and proactively sees all the patients. The goals of the service are to reduce the hazards of hospitalization, to improve care coordination and discharge planning for the patients and improve patient and caregiver education. So essentially the components of ACE care are working with the providers, you know, with regards to the clinical um, reason why the patient came in. But in addition to that, to maintain physical function of the patient, to maintain cognitive function, to maintain mood, because depression is an independent risk factor for mortality in older adults, to ensure that the patients are eating well, to make sure they don't develop pressure ulcers, to make sure that medications that are appropriate are used and to prevent arthrogenesis as much as possible. And to also ensure that our patients, as they are transitioning from the inpatient to the outpatient setting are well cared for with sufficient social support. So a number of things that we do, we have the nurses screening the patients regularly. When the patient comes in, they do a cognitive screen on the patient to determine if they're at risk for delirium. And then they do a delirium screening every 12 hours. They also do the PHQ-2 when the patient comes in to try to determine if the patient is becoming or uh, is depressed in any way. Um, the risk for falls, risk for pressure ulcers, the patient's functional capacity. Um, we have an interdisciplinary team that takes care of the patient. Um, and essentially the interdisciplinary team meets every morning to talk about the patients except on weekends. And we use that ACE tracker tool also. Um, in addition to that, we had a few programs that we also developed that to help improve the care of older adults on the ACE unit, uh, a mobility program that was launched by Grady, a nutrition program, um, using patient safety monitors and volunteers to help with mentation and congregate activities. Uh, of course, the congregate activities have been held up by um, COVID. So we have our nurses who monitor how much the patient is eating to make sure that the patients are eating well and have the dietitian also uh, monitor that to help address as much as possible any nutritional needs that the patient has. Uh, the Get Up and Go Mobility Protocol was actually developed at Grady to help make sure that um, older adults, uh, everyone actually at Grady, that um, the nurses don't wait for physical therapy to see the patient before the patients are mobilized, but the nurses actually do an assessment of the patient, determine what the patient's mobility score is, and then mobilize the patient based off of the score. And, and all these screenings populate uh, the flow sheet in EPIC. When this was piloted on the various units at Grady initially, it was found that there was a significant reduction in length of stay in a number of the units that actually implemented it. Um, also a reduction in the rate of falls, which was somewhat surprising because that's always the reason why um, the nurses feel hesitant and worried about mobilizing patients because of the risk of falls. But we found that the rate of falls was less. Um, the congregate activity we were doing before, but that's been held up by COVID, but provided an opportunity for the patients to get together, play this, you know, play cards, play games. Also, they would, you know, they would be served their meals uh, while they were at that uh, congregate activity. Um, and then we also had volunteers who were working with our patients also, but you know, that's also stalled now with COVID, but they would come in, uh, we developed what's called the Who I Am Delirium Program. And essentially the program was targeted at individualizing the activities that we would do with the patients. So the volunteer would find out what, you know, the patient's preferences are and would actually work with the patient. This is one of, of our patients, the patient's son and the volunteer. And then we trained about 180 patient safety monitors so that they, since they actually sit with the patients, we wanted them to also do the delirium protocols with the patient. And, and so they would do the same thing, find out what the patient's preferences are, what the patient's family situation was like, engage with the patient, and then would do activities with patient and would actually document with the patient. So activities like games, puzzles, friendly conversation, and so on. They would do those activities with the patients and actually document in EPIC what activities they did with the patient. So we, we, we actually compared the results of the patients that got the intervention on the ACE unit 
And then we also had a group of patients on the ACE unit who did not get the intervention and uh, um, some patients on the med surge units, other units that also did not get the intervention. And, and we, the most common activity that was done was the friendly conversation. We also had them doing puzzles and reading materials that were distributed to them. Um, and we found that the, um, there was a significant difference in the delirium scores amongst the patients who had the intervention compared to patients who did not have the intervention. And that's also shown here. So it was significantly more um, amongst the, um, the outcomes were better for the patients who got the intervention. But even the patients who were on the ACE unit who didn't get the intervention, also, there was also a significant difference. And we think that is also because of the fact that the basic delirium protocols were implemented in comparison to patients who were not on the ACE unit at all. And we did get an award from um, the ABIM and NICH for implementing this with the patient safety monitors. So with regards to our ACE data, um, we found that um, as at the time this data was pulled, we had, you know, like had about 2,791 patients. Most of our patients went home, which was what we really wanted. We wanted them to be functional enough to go home rather than going to the nursing home. Um, we also had like amongst these numbers for the length of stay was a comparison of 65 year olds and older patients at Grady. And we found that patients who were on the ACE unit had a significantly lower length of stay. Um, we also noticed that the, the mobility scores were better amongst the patients who were on the ACE unit in comparison to those who were not uh, pre and post intervention. Sorry about that. So again, uh, what we, we, our concern was we had, you know, we wanted to make sure that older adults not on the ACE unit also got, you know, ACE care um, or age appropriate care, irrespective of the unit where they were. And so our thought was to develop processes of care to improve the care of older adults who were not on the ACE unit. One of the things we felt that we needed to do was to build the niche program. So we had done training for a number of the nurses who were on the ACE unit and some units who were not on the ACE unit. But our strategy was to make sure that on all the units at Grady, we trained the nurses and the techs and build capacity for them to take care of older adults. We also implemented, we piloted the virtual ACE and I'll talk about that in a little bit. We also launched the geriatrics consult service to help us care for those older adults and the co-management service. So for the, the virtual ACE, one of the things we did was we wanted to use the ACE tracker tool in the care of those patients. We um, engaged the stakeholders. We also trained uh, the nurses on how to use the ACE tracker tool and how to monitor those patients. And these were nurses who were not on the ACE unit. Um, and then also uh, to have geriatric resource nurses on, on the unit where we, we launched it, who would provide oversight over the screenings that were being done and also provide audit to the staff nurses who were doing the screenings to make sure that protocols were also implemented based off of the findings on the screenings. And then we continued training for them. Uh, so the nurses, essentially the workflow was, the nurses would screen the patients, the geriatric screens that I talked about, cognitive screen, functional screen, uh, risk for falls, risk for pressure ulcers, and so on. And then those screenings would populate the ACE tracker, and then the ACE tracker would be reviewed during the morning huddle um, to identify the risk factors and then implement protocols to improve the care of those patients. We also found that um, we, we looked at the data that we had and found that the uh, the length of stay was better on the ACE unit than the virtual ACE um, still. Um, and then uh, with regards to restraint use and the PSM use, it was much higher on the, on the virtual ACE unit in comparison to the ACE unit. Surprisingly, the restraint you use was a little higher on the actual ACE unit. And you know, that provided some feedback for us on things to do and, and on to reduce restraint use. The mobility scores were actually also better in the geographic ACE unit in comparison to the, the virtual ACE unit. And, and then, you know, I learned a few things from that experience and where actually it's been a work in progress with that. Um, with the consult service, you know, we provide services to medicine, surgery, trauma teams for all patients who are 65 and older. For the co-management service, they refer patients to us who are 85 and older or 65 to 85 who are 
who come in with geriatric syndromes. A few of the things we did here were to create an order set for ortho. We wanted to make it very easy for them in caring for older adults. And so a few of the things that we did were to review the pain medicines that we're using because we found out that a number of the patients were being prescribed medicines that would predispose them to delirium. So that's one of the things that we do. And, and then also to make sure that they had like um, medications for their bowel. Um, so the data for that showed that even though we have the co-management service with geriatrics, orthopedics, and hospital medicine, uh, that the hours in the ED did not significantly change. It was actually higher with the co-management service. And again, that has provided some more work for us to do. Uh, but in comparison, it appeared that the hours in the ED was slightly better for patients who were um, older than 65. And then, but the hours to the OR also uh, was better for those who were younger than 65, uh, but not much better for those who were 65 and older. And we felt that it was probably as a, as a result of the need for further assessment that was needed for these patients. Again, a work in progress uh, for us. So in addition to the, um, inpatient service, we wanted to make sure that older adults in the emergency service were, were or emergency department were well cared for also. Um, realizing that the, the care in the ED is very fast paced. And in addition to that, there's an increased risk for delirium falls, um, even functional decline for the short period of time that the patient spent in the emergency department. And so our goal was really to make some change in the emergency department. Um, the Society of Hospital Medicine and the, um, sorry, the American College of Emergency Physicians and, and, and the Academy of Emergency Medicine Society um, also developed some guidelines in 2013 to try to improve care of older adults. And so these are some of the guidelines that they developed. So we decided to work on a few things. We decided to to implement a screening tool to identify high-risk older adults in the emergency department. Also to uh, begin to screen older adults in the emergency department for delirium so that we could implement care processes early for them. Um, we also wanted to address transitions of care and to make sure that medications were being the right medicines were being used right from the emergency department. So we use a validated tool um, it's called the triad risk assessment tool to identify those high risk older adults by identifying things like um, cognitive impairment. So that would help us know that the patient is at risk for delirium and will start the protocols early. Difficulty in walking and history of falls, meaning that the patient would be at risk for falls and would implement protocols. Medications, high risk medicines, emergency department use in the last 30 days or hospitalization in the last 90 days, or if that patient lived alone, that was also something that we felt was high risk and would need intervention. So usually that risk tool, the emergency department nurse would apply that tool and would screen all boarding patients in the emergency department and would flag the um, niche coordinator, but also referrals were put into pharmacy case management um, and the community health worker based on the screens that were positive and protocols would be implemented. So if the patient had a history of cognitive impairment, they would go ahead to start doing delirium screenings for that patient and implement delirium protocols. For a patient who was at risk for falls, implement fall protocols, high risk medicines, have pharmacy review the medications, um, EDUs in the last 30 days, that patient would be referred to the transitions of care clinic and also be referred to a community health worker. Um, if the patient lived alone or we felt that there was some risk in the living situation of the patient would also be referred to the CHW and, and the um, social worker. And then anything else that the, felt, the ED nursing staff felt was a high risk issue that needed to be addressed. This is an example of the TRIS tool in EPIC. So the patients are screened and it populates the list for the niche coordinator. Um, subsequently, the patient is screened for delirium. You can see that this patient um, with the new, new desk score had a delirium score of four, but subsequently after staying in the ED, by the next day, the delirium score was now eight. So that you know, gives you a sense of what happens in the emergency department. 
So essentially, uh, in doing that, our goal uh, for our work in the emergency department, ultimately where we're going to is to, to get like a geriatric emergency department certification um, so that we make sure that appropriate protocols of care are implemented for those patients. The other thing that we did was to, we wanted to make sure that our patients who were being discharged were being discharged in a safe fashion and that they were plugged into resources in, in the community to help take care of them. So this was one of the programs that we actually piloted here at Grady, which was very successful using community health workers. We felt it was a cost-effective way of making sure that patients were cared for post-discharge. Uh, so the CHW essentially worked with the patient, but also acted as a liaison between the primary care provider of the patient and the ACE coordinator and helped with coordination of care. So essentially the CHWs followed the patients for a period of 12 months and the intervention was light initially for days zero to 60, where they would visit the patient at home weekly, would make weekly phone calls to the patient, would accompany the patient to the visit with their primary care pro provider, but would also help with coordinating the care of the patient, appointments, medications, transportation, and so on. By days 60 to 120, they did the bi-weekly home visits, bi-weekly phone calls to the patient, and they also did develop health goals with the patient and self-management education. So they would revisit these health goals and make sure that the patient was making progress. And then would now at this point, support the patient to take ownership of coordinating their own care. And then subsequently by days 121 to 360, they, the, their home visits were now monthly and biweekly phone calls and so on. And we, it, actually demonstrated a lot of success, right? There was a significant reduction in readmission rates for those patients, also a significant reduction in emergency department visits for those patients. And then healthcare utilization costs were significantly lower. This is actually the charges that were posted on the patient's chart um, as to the cost of their utilization of the ED or the readmissions they had had. And so um, what, for us, we felt that um, a lot of the work we had done was on the ACE unit and in the emergency department. Um, but one of the things we wanted to make sure to do was to make sure that whatever we're doing on the ACE unit was disseminated throughout the healthcare system. Our goal was also to get our geriatric emergency department certification. And that's one of the things that we're working on right now. For the age-friendly health system, that's something also that we are working on right now and we've developed processes of care to make sure that it's disseminated. So our goal was really to go from um, the ACE unit where we were, but to implement the 4Ms framework across all the inpatient units. We also took into account that the fact that Grady um, has vulnerable older adults with multiple needs. So beyond the 4Ms framework that was developed by IHI, we added a fifth M, which was more focused on malnutrition. And then in addition to that, another M focused on transitions of care and making sure that our patients are plugged in into the community with all the resources that they have. A few of the things that were our goals were to reduce, um, to increase mobility and reduce functional decline amongst all the patients patients, irrespective of whether they were on the ACE unit or not, to decrease some of the hospital acquired conditions, to decrease the incidence of delirium, adverse medication reactions, readmissions, length of stay, and so on. And we began the pilot on the ACE unit in, in February of this year. Um, we developed tools to address some of those goals, like what matters. We developed goals to address that medication, cementation, mobility, malnutrition, and so on. We also wanted to make sure that it aligned with Grady's organization goals um, in, you know, with regards to patient engagement and well-being, quality and safety, and growth and financial strength for the hospital. So we had like for the what matters, we had older adults, we put together an advisory team um, consisting of some older adults who helped us in developing questions that would help us identify what the goals of the patient were. Um, they wanted us to, they wanted to make sure that we communicated to the patients that we were all working together for a common goal and that we were very interested in holistic care for the patients 
and we you know, wanted to also build trust in our relationship with the patient. Those were their recommendations. So essentially we developed these some questions that are asked to the patient on admission, but also daily to find out what their goals are. Um, some of the questions the nurses would ask, but also we have the free form text box to, to actually find out from the patient what their goals were. Um, and so um, that enabled us to incorporate that M and, and we have that flow sheet in Epic. Fermentation, we developed, we already had some tools that we're using on the ACE unit, the six item screener, which helps to, uh, to determine what the patient's cognitive status is, the new desk, which helps us with delirium screening, and then the PHQ to, to, to determine if the patient is becoming depressed. So what we did was we used the tools that we already had in Epic. We added one more tool, which is called the AWOL tool. It helps to determine the patient risk of delirium. We did that because we wanted to essentially, um, if we were resource limited, to make sure that we implemented protocols for those who were at significant risk for delirium. Uh, in addition to the screening tools, we also have the nurses for the protocols do early incorporate as part of the early rounding they were already doing to incorporate play into that. So the nurses in general do the five Ps during the early rounding, pain, body position, personals and forms, but we incorporated play into that because we wanted to make it as efficient as possible for the nurses, uh, but also to make sure that it was being done. Uh, the next for the medication M, um, we, um, we're able to determine on the ACE tracker the BEARS meds that the patients are on and provide feedback to the team. But in addition to that, a BPA was developed in EPIC for providers to help remind them uh, if they prescribe a medication that was high risk, they, that BPA would fire and then they would have to choose another medicine if they thought that it was appropriate to change the medication. Um, one of the things that we also did was uh, with regards to mentation to use um, technology. So because with COVID, we couldn't really have volunteers anymore to do the diversional activities with them. We had the, the sitters who were doing that, but it wasn't quite sufficient. We actually did apply for a grant and uh, we got a grant from Google to get iPads to, to use um, for our older adults to help minimize the isolation that they had by not being able to communicate with their family and friends, but also to be able to do activities that would help their mentation. And in addition to that, when they are discharged, they would be able to go home with that tablet and be able to do their telehealth visit. So that's one of the things that we did. Um, then with mobility, the get up and go protocols were launched hospital wide at Gradient and we were using that. Um, for the fifth M, the dietitian would screen the patient for malnutrition. The nurses would monitor how much the patient was eating. The dietitian would, prior to discharge, determine if the, the patient was food insecure. And then the patient would be referred to Open Hand, which is an organization that provides meals, and they would provide at least 10 meals to help that patient during the transitions of care period. We also have been in the process of, of um, developing an, a, frame, um, a network of community-based organizations, uh, partnerships with them so that they would help us in the care of the patient when the patients are discharged to provide resources that the patient would need at discharge. We felt that this was very important for the patient population that we care for at Grady. So these were additional to the four M's that IHI had developed. Um, essentially what we've been doing is to make sure that all the M's are incorporated into the early rounding that the nurses do and during the bedside shift report that they do. Also the whiteboard, uh, we have developed that and also encouraging the nurses to use that um, so that they're able to communicate to other members of the healthcare team so they know what the goals of the patient is and be able to implement that. Um, we felt that not everyone would be able to open up EPIC to know what the goals of the patient are, even though the nurses are documenting that in EPIC. So the whiteboard acted as a way for us to do that, um, to do that communication between other members of the healthcare team, between the nurse and the tech and other members of the healthcare team. 
So essentially, this shows a little bit of the timeline of what we've been doing with regards to the age-friendly health system. In February, it was launched on the ACE unit. And then subsequently, we began training for 9A, uh, which was the next unit where we were to spread it to um, in May. But, you know, again, 9A become, became a COVID unit. So that solved a little bit, but when the process of restarting that. But our goal is really that throughout the hospital, we'll provide training to the nurses, to the techs and other members of the interdisciplinary team to make sure that older adults are well cared for. Um, one of the things that was very um, foundational to our work actually uh, was to have members of or leads for the various departments be members of our project team. So we had the um, head of rehab services as part of the team that, you know, that led the mobility M. We also had Dr. Jagas and Debbie Vigliotti who are leads for pharmacy as part of our medication leads, um, um, mentation, nutrition, the lead for, for nutrition services at Grady. So this has been very helpful in making sure that uh, we have engagement for all the staff and all, you know, to make up our team to care for the patients. Um, so that's essentially, and then we have um, the VP for nursing actually. So she is driving some of the change that we have um, amongst the nurses. And then we have the BI team also helping us to create our dashboard and, and the workbench that we're using. Currently they've created like a workbench for us. And so we're able to see what the compliance is like with regards to the screenings that are being done and then for protocol implementation. So that's that's it. That's um, what some of the work that we've been doing at Grady. So if you have any questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Obonwa. Uh, this is really fantastic. And I, I think I'm, I'm gonna help uh, manage the Q&A and we uh, have some really nice comments in the chat. So I hope that you'll take a look there as well. Um, uh, Nate Spell mentioning it's a beautiful story of impactful work over time, vision, interprofessional collaboration, impressive results and constant learning. So thanks for sharing. From Muhammad Musa, uh, we have a question. So great talk and awesome implementation of the ACE model, previous studies in JAGS and B. MJ um, have not necessarily shown a statistical significance on readmissions and mortality at three months. It's great to see better results at Grady. Any difficulty that you encountered convincing hospital administrators to support and fund the ACE unit, especially in the pandemic? So the, the pandemic has stalled quite a bit of the work that we've been doing at Grady. It stalled the work that we're doing our geriatrics ED certification. It also stalled the um, the dissemination to other units. I think that Grady, because we had already had like footprints at Grady prior to the pandemic, so that helped us to get things going. Um, like 11B, which is a current ACE unit, was actually a COVID unit. So as soon as the initial surge died down, when we spoke with Grady leadership, they were willing to, you know, start the ACE care there. So I think that probably because of the footprints that we had, they, you know, they were very accepting of some of the changes that we wanted to make. But certainly it, it did stall quite a bit of the work that we had been doing, the progress, yeah. And I think you had some guidance from, uh, I know Kelly Flood at UAB uh, as well as a champion and um, Mike Malone up at uh, Aurora Healthcare that's, you know, provided some, you know, input also in health systems where it's been very successful. I don't know if there's any comment there on just kind of leveraging national partners to. Absolutely. Oh, go ahead. Sorry about that. You were, you were, um, yes. Yeah, so we did partner quite a bit like the S the, the ACE tracker was actually initially developed at Aurora. And so they were very helpful in providing the ACE tracker to us. And that's been very helpful in monitoring our patients. We also did, um, actually, we actually went to UAB a couple of times because they had these, they had already uh, made quite a lot of progress in the care of older adults in the inpatient setting. And so we went there to actually see what they were doing. And that was very helpful. And they've provided support to us. Any questions, anything? They've actually, one of the Grady vice presidents did go to UAB with us. And so that also helped with the engagement of Grady leadership to see what other people were doing. And so, you know, that, that, that was very helpful. 
Um, we have another question uh, from Jennifer Christie about the community health worker pipeline um, and whether those positions were paid or volunteer. So at the time we did that with the CHWs, we actually had a grant in place and it, it was actually a grant from United Way. And so that it, they paid for the community health workers to do that work. Um, when the grant, um, after the grant ran out, Grady actually kept the community health workers in the transitions of care clinic. So unlike the at the time they were with us, they would do, they would participate in the interdisciplinary rounds and actually see what's going on with the patient in the clinical setting and then follow up with the patient. We don't have that um, anymore, but at least in the transitions of care clinic, we still have the CHWs and um, they're able to follow up with the patients and actually go home um, and, and visit the patients at home. Um, let's see, Ted Johnson said, congratulations uh, into the team for years of work. And to me, it seemed that the strongest outcome data were on falls, delirium, and length of stay. What did your team see as their best results? Um, so I, I think it's the same. We've seen like reduction in delirium. Uh, we've seen reduction in, in falls by piloting some of those protocols. We think that some of the things that have contributed to the success are actually that interdisciplinary team approach, having team members see the patients pretty early, um, not having to wait for physical therapy to see the patient days down the road, but they are able to see the patients early and make recommendations with regards to where the patient should be going to. So I think that that has contributed quite a bit to some of the successes that we've seen um, in the care of the older adult. Yeah. I, um, again, Yugochi also just really inspired by all of the, the effort and work, and um, it's so wonderful to be able to share this today. I wondered if you might share also just any pearls that you have as a you know, physician leader at Grady of how you have, you know, what's your approach to that initial engagement of you know, the kind of interdisciplinary team, uh, as well as maybe also thinking about the C-suite, you know, the kind of executive leadership too. That's right. So I think that that has been um, a major part. This, you know, like I said, took years. So I would say between 2002 to about 2012, we were in the process of trying to engage the C-suite. Um, but fortunately, we now had um, the CEO and one of the vice presidents actually listened to us when we presented what we wanted to do, what was our vision, what was our dream for older adults at Grady. And she took that and, and, you know, and, and was very instrumental to the work that we're doing at Grady. So I think that one of the major things in building programs is to make sure that the C-suite is engaged. And that, that has led to some of the success that we've had. Also, because the C-suite was engaged, they actually assigned a program administrator to us who was able to get all these members of the healthcare team who were leads in the various departments. So that helped to bring everyone together um, to help you know, develop the workflow, the care processes, everyone was involved in that. And then subsequently in implementation. So I, 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 I think that um, finding a way to make a case to the C-suite is very critical in, in, in helping one to be successful. And it's still a work in progress, right? We have needs, we need you know, niche coordinators, staffing to actually build this program. Like if you're thinking about disseminating to other parts of the hospital, then you're thinking about um, a coordinator who would monitor and who would help have oversight for the program to be successful. So you know, having ways to engage the C-suite and making them, making a case with them and, and making sure that they see what the case is, is very critical. So. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Obanwa and look forward to more. Thank you so much. See you later.